Many individuals have the notion that meat is just a variety of animal tissue that contains proteins and small amounts of vitamins and minerals vital for the human body. On the other hand, it can also produce a numerous amount of byproducts for people's wants and needs. But where and how does meat and its byproducts become manufactured and preserved? The term meat comes from one of the most essential businesses throughout history known as the meatpacking industry. The Union Stockyards in Chicago, Illinois became a focal point of processing more meat than any other place in the world and becoming an integral part of Chicago's history. What they were was a way for Chicago to bring together all of its resources for the processing and the packing of meat. The Union Stockyards was the largest livestock market in the world. The industry may have been profitable, but it was also known as a repulsive and unhealthy district for many U.S. citizens, which may have been instigated by greedy business employers and supposedly a piece of controversial literature. On Christmas Day in 1865, when families across the nation gathered together to celebrate the birth of Christ, the birth of the Chicago Union Stockyards originated, and also marked a significant time in the city's economic and public experience. Throughout Chicago, small stockyards were expanded along a variety of rail lines that came from the west to transport numerous animals. Eventually, all the small stockyards came to a consolidation into one enormous industry, where the operation took place in the new city community area of Chicago and continued to provide meat to its citizens for over an entire millennium. It was on the south side, uh, not too far if the people imagine from U.S. Cellular Field, a community area called uh, New City, uh, but it more, more often called Back of the Yards. Uh, and sometimes called Packing Town. The main factor that contributed to Chicago's need for a more focused stockyard was the westward railroad expansion. This made Chicago a profitable midpoint of a dominant railroad mainstream between the east and west coasts. The transit cars would deliver countless livestock, hogs, and sheep to the stockyards from the city's main rail lines and unload them down wide thoroughfares and then into pens. There was this maze of pens and chutes and ramps uh, uh, that you had to take the animals up and down and away from the trains and into the pens and after they were purchased drive them over to the packing houses to the west of the stockyards largely or back to the trains and they would be shipped to another market for kill. By the year 1900 the stockyards perimeter had about 130 miles of track and grew about 500 acres. Additionally employing over 25,000 workers and producing 82 percent of the meat consumed in the United States. The record hog run was 120,000 hogs in one day. If you think about that, a hog is a fairly substantial animal. And they one load 120,000 of them on a train and then sell them and then send them out the same day was pretty amazing. The creation of the Union Stockyards attracted many meatpacking companies throughout Chicago. In 1867, an American businessman named Philip Armour and his firm Armour & Company was the first to dominate the industry. Several other meatpacking firms such as Swift, Morris, Wilson, and Hammond were involved within the industry. However, it wasn't until 1872 when industrial and strategic advancements took place for these companies. Gustavus Swift, originally from Massachusetts, changed the way of how we ship processed meat. Swift created the refrigerated transit car in 1882 to transfer processed meat to the East Coast markets as opposed to live animals. Furthermore, just like Swift, the other companies began making a unique use of slaughterhouse byproducts, such as the manufacturing of leather, soap, fertilizer, glue, imitation ivory, gelatin, buttons, perfume, and violin strings. Swift used to uh, brag that he used everything but the squeal of the hog. You know, and if he could somehow can the squeal, he'd use the squeal. Companies like Wil Wilson uh, was another example where they started out as the sporting, as the uh, meat packer, Wilson Meat Packers, but really what they're known for today is uh, sporting goods. Well, where did all those, uh, the leather for the football, where did that come from? Well, that came from the byproducts from the packing houses uh, and the, um, the gut for tennis rackets and uh, athletic shoes like cleats for uh, football, 
All of that came from byproducts. Chicago Meatpacking Factories laid the groundwork for the assembly line production. In order for each laborer to experience the technique of slaughtering, meatpackers would divide the work of slaughtering animals. With this mind, the technique would speed up the process of packaging and distributing, but the yards itself presented a sloppy image that led to a bad reputation. We lived right by the stockyard, and my mother used to say you'd never get pneumonia because nothing could live in your lungs if you lived near the stockyards. Uh, there's just there's this, this smell, and you can, uh, some people say they could tell the time of day by how the smell changed. Hardly any food safety laws were enforced. With regards to no financial and legal incentives, employers felt that there was no need for public health precautions. Additionally, working areas were not cleaned, and no measures were taken to keep rats and bugs out of the meat. Employees would not even bother to wash their hands or wear clean clothes. As an employee of the stockyards, thousands of hard workers ultimately suffered repulsive and unfair working conditions. Everything from offensive odors to excruciating screeches of slaughtered animals, not to mention standing on amidst bloody floors. One way that you would knock out the cow was by uh, knocking them on the head with, literally with a sledgehammer. Um, so sometimes the sledgehammers didn't work. So maybe the, the cow was only wounded, so they would run amok. Uh, in on the floor so you could get trampled by livestock. Considering that a majority of workers, including immigrants, worked 12-hour day shifts, the stockyard employers paid them low wages and provided no benefits. Ultimately, the workers had enough. They were all experts at, at using the product to make byproducts uh, and at using their labor force, uh, at paying the minimum to get the maximum. Near the end of the 1880s, thousands of stockyard employees went on strike and planned to unionize to reform their rough working environment. Unfortunately, efforts failed due to everyone's biased opinion toward the level of expertise and diverse backgrounds. This problem lasted up until the Great Depression, where workers finally began to look past racial and ethnic differences and make union organizing successful. When the stockyard employees were striving to unionize, an American author and journalist named Upton Sinclair published his book, The Jungle, in 1906. The novel is a narrative piece that focuses on a Lithuanian immigrant who moves to Chicago with his family and endures a horrifying living and working experience at the stockyards while struggling with poverty. Specifically, The Jungle establishes the cruel conditions that the stockyard workers experience under capitalism. Sinclair's goal was to reveal the truth behind the stockyards. In addition, his main objective was to let readers know that capitalism and the high-class citizens are controlling our society, and that needed to change. Above all, the jungle caused chaos that partly contributed to the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Meat Inspection Act in 1906. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who was president at the time, there's a story about him, whether it's true or not, I don't know that he uh, stopped uh, being able to, to eat his breakfast sausage because of after having read The Jungle. Um, what Upton Sinclair said about his book was that, uh, you know, I aimed for people's heart, that is to, to convert people to socialism, and what he hit was their stomach because people's stomachs were essentially turned by the, the, uh, uh, the unsanitary conditions in which their meat was processed. In one explanation of a meatpacking industry, Sinclair quotes in the jungle, Here were also tons of garbage festering in the sun, and the greasy laundry of the workers hung out to dry. In dining rooms littered with food and black with flies. In toilet rooms that were open sewers. Moving ahead into post-World War II, the demise of the Chicago Union stockyards and packing houses ironically came as a result of new technological transportation and distribution methods. Once the truck can replace the train, uh, that gives a tremendous amount of mobility to meat packers. They can go out to places in Oklahoma and buy cattle right off the plains and then just bring them in. They don't have to rely on the trains. In the 1950s, meat packing companies such as Armour, Swift, and Wilson found it hard to compete and abandoned their plants and relocated towards rural communities to carry on business with farmers. In 1971, the Chicago Union Stockyards closed its doors. The technology moved on. Of course, it's hard to retrofit old technology with new technology. And so we don't think of the 1970s as a technologically forward time, but compared to, say, 1900, when maybe a lot of the meat, packer, meat packing houses were made, um, the, certainly there was new technology that was being used, uh, and it was just expensive for those companies to catch up. 
Currently, various small factories still remain in the vicinity of the yards, none of which are involved in the meatpacking industry. Times change, but legacies live forever. Today, even though meatpacking plants do not exist in Chicago, the limestone structure gate, dating back from the heyday era of the Union Stockyards, continue to arch over Exchange Avenue and can be seen along Halstead Street on the south side of Chicago, Illinois, to remember an important piece of Chicago history.